Um, we are in uncharted territory, but we have some wonderful experts both to chart where we've come from and to chart the implications of all this for uh, the future. Um, we are going to begin with uh, Jeff Evans and Jane Green, co-directors of the British Election Study, to explain to us what the vote was, what its implications are, where it leads us. We'll move on to Vernon Bogdanor to navigate us through the Constitution, Sarah Hegeman to tell us about the implications for the European Union and for other European Union countries, uh, and Catherine Costello to specifically focus on immigration, one of the big issues of the referendum. Over to you, Jeff. Great. Well, I'll jump straight in then. I'll be talking about the past, not the future. I'll leave Jane to talk possibly about the more uh, campaign-focused discussion of the EU referendum. Uh, but I'm going to focus at the, the prehistory of how we got here. Who's responsible? And I'll use lots of numbers, but I won't bore you with too many of them. So I'm going to focus on, on for the sake of argument, one person. The architect of Brexit is Tony Blair. He probably wouldn't think of it in that sort of way. Tony Blair set up Brexit. He didn't intend to, but he did, through, did so in three different ways. And he's now voted to ignore the result of the referendum, of course, which is an added irony, given that he actually popularised the notion of an EU referendum when he was the Prime Minister. The three ways in which Blair has led to this outcome, with, with the collaboration of what we might call New Labour, uh, in three projects I've been doing, uh, with James Tilley and with John Mellon. Um, one is the political exclusion of the working class from electoral politics in Britain. <laughs> Two is the promotion of immigration to a central position which has been decisive. And three is completely failed to understand the actual nature of society in Britain. So, first one first. Um, so, we know that in the 1990s, lots of working class people voted. And the difference between middle class and working class people in Britain in terms of turnout in elections was really small. Nothing like America. America is a very class divided society in terms of who participates. And Blair and New Labour arrived on the scene and they did quite a few things. They obliterated any reference to the working class from their, their speeches, their manifestos, and the work for this has been done by Chris Prosser from the British Election Study team, who is actually sitting here, I think. Um, they, they removed the gap between themselves and the Conservatives in order to make themselves more acceptable as a middle class party. They alienated their working class voters in doing <coughs> so, and they stuffed Parliament with lots and lots of middle class people. In 1960, the Labour Party had 44% of people who'd done working class jobs. Uh, between 92 and 97, what was left of these was wiped out, and we've now got about 6 or 7% of, of people in the Labour Party, and MPs I'm talking about, who've done working class jobs. So he eradicated class from politics, or at least he eradicated the working class from politics. The direct consequence of this followed, or well, several did actually, the end of class voting. But more importantly for what we're talking about today, the growth of a massive difference in political participation between the educated middle classes and others in our society, especially working class, less well-educated people, the very people who form the basis of the outward vote. To give you an example, from being pretty even, by 2015, 83% of degree-level educated middle class people voted controlling statistically, as, as I would do, for many, many things which might contaminate this result. If we look at working class people with low levels of education, the same participation rate was 48%. Eight, so 87%, 48%, your average middle class participation rate is 85%. That is a massive transition in the participation of those people in our democracy in a very short space of time nothing to do with inequality and all those sorts of things, we've looked at them. It's to do with the fact that these people were not given a choice. And specifically, they were not given a choice by Labour, their former representatives. So what did they do? Primarily, they stopped voting. A few percolated eventually to UKIP, that must be said. But what they mainly did was stop voting and feel that politics wasn't for them. So that's the first thing he achieved. Uh, he also won some elections along the way, it might be said. He did this because he calculated quite accurately that the working class is a shrinking group and they're clustered in you know, many northern constituencies where you can win regardless of who you put in there. He didn't need them, basically. 
Um, it worked well up to a point. He then introduced, however, the second part of his, of his mistakes. Um, I gave a talk to the Parliamentary Labour Party in 2012 about the role of Labour's um, not particularly successful handling of immigration in the 2010 election and its consequent for their, consequence for their vote. Uh, at the end of my talk, um, the, the Labour Shadow Minister for Immigration came up to me and said how relieved he was at last we could actually talk about immigration. That for several years, if you mentioned immigration in the party, you were declared a racist. And only now, now they were no longer in power, it must be said, um, could you actually discuss this issue that their voters <coughs> cared about. And I think that was quite informative. It's as though the Labour elite had made their own party not actually discuss this. And if they did, they would label them as bad. And I think they probably hoped that the population as a whole might follow the same line. So what John Mellon and I did, went and examined lots and lots of polls for many years, looking at the aggregate level polls, looking at detailed individual level relationships between fears about immigration and attitudes to the EU. And we found, using the International Passenger Survey for Immigration Rates, that, yeah, immigration was going up prior to 2004, prior to the accession countries. But it wasn't, obviously, EU immigration. Concern about immigration went up too, and it was linked to this. After 2004, when Blair chose to have untrammeled immigration from East European countries, accession countries, where other major nations in the West chose not to for five years, it ensured that we had actually effectively, to use the term a little loosely, mass um, immigration from Eastern Europe. Immigration that the population couldn't avoid, that actually the newspapers helped them, I'm sure, but in their personal lives also they saw it. What did they do? Well, people are actually reasonably perceptive. And this ch I've got a chapter on called exactly that in, in a book coming out with Phil Cowley and Rob Ford that um, is quite popular. Um, they put two and two together. So as, as immigration increased, the proportion of people who were from Europe also increased dramatically. Partly because David Cameron tried to reduce it with his ridiculous pledge to get it less than 100,000. The only people he could target were Commonwealth and other sorts of immigrants. He couldn't target the EU. So they dropped. We don't have enough Bangladeshi chefs, for example, now because of this. Um, but EU immigrants became more starkly the biggest group of immigrants into our country. So they are bigger than any of the Commonwealth or non-Commonwealth immigrants. And this tracked very carefully with concern about immigration. The other things didn't. It, immigration became EU at the aggregate level like that. If you look at the individual level, what you saw was that people put two and two together. Their attitudes on Europe were increasingly shaped by their concern about immigration. And they weren't fools. By 2013, <coughs> EU immigration dominated immigration. People's attitudes to that was very strongly related to, the, to their views on Europe. But the deal was done in that sense because actually, although you might argue that the excluded working class and others from Blair's earlier days were protest voters, the immigration issue turned this from just a protest to being excluded to a real core issue, a real issue, and the only issue in this chaotic insane campaign that we've just seen with masses of ludicrous claims on both sides, especially on the Leave side about the economic issues, it didn't matter. Um, the one incontrovertible fact was that we could not control EU immigration and the EU made damn clear that we knew it. So there was nowhere to go on that. Project Fear was on the economy in general focus on that because it didn't have much choice really. So we, we had a situ situation where you'd excluded lots of people you then made an issue that they cared about, a key issue that, from which you could not actually have any wiggle room. And then David Cameron was unlucky enough to be very successful in 2015. I'm sure he never in a million years thought he would be. Um, and then we got the vote. Now, what I've said so far actually doesn't in itself nail it. You don't get over that 58-42 line, probably on a small working class who don't like immigrants, but actually, I think Blair's understanding of what class is was probably wrong. A, a paper I've got this morning out at Portcullis House, which I think is doing the rounds in the newspapers now, 
looks at <coughs> class in a different way. It looks at class as a subjective thing, as a feeling of who you are. And it shows that although in our society since, say, 1983, we've become a very much more highly educated professional and managerial society, the proportion of people who see themselves as working class has not changed. It's 60%. The objective working class, according to, say, ONS figures, and Andrew knows these sorts of things very well, the measures of class that are very well attested to, is about 25%. But 60% of those people who aren't, of the population, think that they're working class, including 47% of the professional and managerial classes. Not the middling groups, the professional and managerial classes. What does it mean? It means that we're not quite the society we think we are. And it pans out in various ways. Because one of the key things, one of the key ways in which these people differ from, say, other middle class people is that they share views on the economy. They know, I mean, to, to think of John Prescott, they know they've got two jags, they don't want to pay too much tax, they're pretty right wing on that stuff. But to also um, paraphrase Prescott, who was misquoted constantly on class, by the way, what he did say was that he was basically a, middle, a man with a middle class lifestyle, but with the values of the working class. In actual fact, the values of the working class are kept by these people, and they're about anti-immigration and social. <laughs> Hopefully, you can still hear me. Social <laughs> illiberalism. So, when you take into account the fact that what, what the journalist Patrick Butler, who I talked to great length to um, yesterday, said, the, the, the uh, you know, we discussed the social class of the mind. We've actually got a very different demographic structure than we think we've got. <coughs> And it's one in which concerns about immigration are actually far prominent, far higher up the social structure as we normally think of it. <coughs> and the same thing applies to education, by the way. These things no, don't buy you the liberal values that the, the liberal intelligentsia assume it does. We've got a different society. And Blair failed to understand that. He thought he could marginalise the working class, give them no choice, still win elections. To a point he was right. But as soon as you move away from a majoritarian system, that doesn't hold anymore. And when you factor into the account, there's lots and lots of people who are not technically working class, but still feel aggrieved about these changes. The, as you put the, 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 the consensus between liberals, Labour and the Conservatives on many aspects of European integration and liberal values that they feel left out from, then that then that opportunity to actually vote a clear choice not only leads to people participating, as we saw a decent turnout of 73%, but it also gets to the result where you get to 52, 48. And jo what John also did the other day, actually, when we put this on a blog site, we looked at what we call the UK curious, I'm sorry, the UKIP curious. We were being slightly tongue in cheek with the terminology, it must be said. Well, we thought, OK, UKIP had, what, 13% of the vote at the last election, which, if you take into account, the turnout was about less than 9% of the electorate. But if you look at people who say they voted UKIP at any time between, say, January 2014 and now, and maybe just a few people on top of that who say that they're actually thinking of doing so in future, it's 40%, fractionally under 40%. Which is actually, when you take into account the turnout, just over the 52% we need to see a, a lead vote in this referendum. I'm being slightly mischievous because actually not everybody did vote, but 70% of those people voted to leave. So that's what Blair got wrong. He failed to understand that if you marginalise people, they can sometimes get the chance to express their views. He also got wrong, perhaps, an understanding of the way that the social structure was changing and miscalculated how middle class and liberal and highly educated we, we, we were, or at least what the implications of that are. So, Splendid. That's my talk. Splendid. So, oh, uh, I do have a slight implication. You mentioned to me I was supposed to make some implications. Well, you can do it in a moment. Very quickly. <laughs> I just thought of it. I think this is really good for division in our society. Because had the Leavers lost, they're the people who feel they have no voice. They're the people who feel isolated. I was in a pub in Stoke last week discussing this with a lot of people, and they had a sense that at last they'd been heard. And that's quite good for social division, I think, because had those people then lost this as well as everything else in the last few decades, then they'd have pretty much given up on politics, which is why I do worry about people talking about 
having another referendum with impossible barriers to actually pass. That would just nail the coffin, I think, of British democracy. So I think on division terms, this has actually been a positive outcome within the limits of the, of the nightmare, should it all. Should it all. <laughs> OK, well, we'll... And, and one more thing. The Labour Party are in deep trouble because, <coughs> just like the Scots Labour Party, they joined rather half-heartedly, it must be said, with the enemy. And their supporters are naturally far closer, probably, to something like UKIP, if UKIP could get its act together and still survive. But I'll leave that sort of speculation to... We'll come on to that, I'm sure. That will be unavoidable.